This week, a male Tel Aviv bus driver shouted at a 20-year-old female passenger for wearing a tank top that he considered to be immodest. He shouted at passenger Roni Imbar repeatedly to put a shirt on. This is in steamy, hot Tel Aviv, one must remember. You can't walk around like that, the driver said, and Inbar said another passenger even joined him. She told Israeli television that the whole bus remained silent except for a mother who told the driver that she can wear whatever she wants. Inbar told the television station that she felt totally humiliated and that she posted what happened to her to Instagram so it doesn't happen to others. The bus company company apologized, of course, but this is hardly the first time that this is happening in today's Israel. The fact that Inbar is speaking up and publicizing her story is the glass half full here. But according to this week's What Matters Now guest, attorney Susan Weiss, men are increasingly emboldened to marginalize and sexualize women, even as avenues for the protection of their rights, such as the Supreme Court, are being shut. We do have this dichotomy in this country. We have this this situation where women can be fighter pilots, but they can't get divorced. The founder of the Center for Women's Justice joined me this week in Jerusalem to analyze how the status of women has changed since the current right-wing and highly religious government has taken office. Spoiler it's not good. We also talk about the new Barbie movie and what message Weiss took away that makes her feel bold. So this week, we ask attorney Dr. Susan Weiss, what matters now? Susan, thank you so much for joining me here in the Nomi Studios in Jerusalem. It's my pleasure to be here with you, always. So this week, we have heard from our environment minister that she would like to open two national parks in sex-segregated hours. And so I ask you in this week, what matters now? To protest against the sexualization of women, which is uh, now one of the agendas of the new government. Okay, last time we spoke was in December, before the whole judicial overhaul legislation was rolled out, and we were talking more about the looming override clause, which is actually not so much on the table right now. But at that point, you had written an op-ed, and we discussed different spheres in which you projected possibly, maybe, could be, women would be affected. And so one of those spheres was actually in gender segregation. What are you seeing on the ground now? So, for example, the Knesset decided to have a conference on the right to segregate, which was for us astounding, actually, because we, we women's groups, including the Center for Women's Justice, asked to participate in that conference, and we were refused. And so there was a conference on the right to segregate in the Knesset itself, and they did not allow the women's groups who opposed to segregation to be present there. This is just emblematic of the situation that is becoming more mainstreamed, would you say? It's doublespeak. It's word games. It's dissimulation. It's, uh, you know, the same way you call a terrorist, you'll call him a freedom fighter or a freedom fighter or a terrorist. And that's what I feel is going on, that we're having this dissimulation, all this confusion. And uh, one of the most important things I think we can do is to parse it out and to critique what's happening so that we really understand that what's happening is the sexualization of women and the fact that they're not considered uh, agents or objects uh, equivalent to men. And the state is taking part in that. So I think it's important for us to emphasize that all the time. I think there are many people in this situation with the national parks, for example. We're talking about two little national parks outside uh-huh. of Jerusalem. And Silman uh, proposed that the sex segregation would be outside of normal working hours. So who cares? What does right. it matter? I think we're being sucker punched every day. That's how I'm feeling that, you know, a little bit, it's not so bad. Oh, just the little override clause. We'll make just little adjustments here and there to all sorts of uh, laws, and that's not going to hurt anybody. But I think if you look at it in the whole picture of what's happening here, I think that the whole notion of family values, Avi Moz has set up a special body in the government for family values, which is actually 
a body that is against homosexuals and it's keeping women in their proper roles, which is in the home and, and, and you know, in the bedroom. And I think that's very scary. What's happening is all part of that. But on the other hand, we feminists, and I definitely consider myself a feminist, want to be able to uh, have equality as women. And so what about those who would say that there should be religious equality and those who just really cannot bathe at the same time as a person of the opposite gender okay. is bathing? What about them? Well, I, that's fine. I agree. But only in private spaces, not in public spaces. I think in public spaces, it has to be clear what the policy of the government is, which is to is equality, and it's it's not it's not segregation. We wouldn't segregate black people from white people. We wouldn't segregate Jews from non-Jews, and we shouldn't segregate men from women. Not as the policy of the state. So, if you want to go to a private pool and and swim only with women, then that certainly is your prerogative. And if the pool can justify it financially, then let them do that. But the the state should be promoting equal, a certain value system. And that value system should be one of equality and freedom and uh, and human rights and, and not one of separation and segregation and discrimination. Discrimination, you know, separate is never equal. I really fear that this is something that will spread, and it has spread. So, for example, uh, with the institutions of higher learning, now they're encouraging more and more institutions of higher learning to allow for the separation of, uh, you know, Haredi men who don't want to study with uh, women in the classroom. And as I read, actually, the Supreme Court case on that matter, I understood that they had to allow women um, women to teach Haredi men. They, the, that was where they drew the line. In other words, they were allowing for separate institutions, separate learning, but uh, women uh, lecturers had to be allowed to teach uh, men. But as I understand it, that's not happening on the ground. That's, so, of course, in a public institution such as the Hebrew University or Tel Aviv University, which is partially funded by our tax shekels. I, I think almost all of the institutions get taxpayer money. Of course, there are a couple of spheres which women are not allowed to enter anyway, and that is, of course, in the rabbinate, no women can sit on a rabbinical court, things of that matter. And do you see this getting worse in the oh, past my, eight uh, months? Okay, much worse, actually. There's a law, they, they, I don't know if it's proposed or actually was passed already, <laughs> A law to multiply the number of rabbis in the in the cities and to make them subject to the to the chief rabbinate, and so if obviously women are not getting any of those jobs. I'm not sure what those jobs do. And one of uh, the th things that Nitzan Kaspi Shiloni from the office has suggested is that this is going to actually harm liberal Orthodox women because the rabbis in the cities you know, if will have to be subject to the halachic uh, determinations and decisions of the chief rabbinate. So if they say women can't read from the Torah or women can't, uh, read from the Megillah, then that's going to affect the rights of liberal women. But aside from the fact that it's just <laughs> it's just buttressing the patriarchy more and more and more and more. And also there are laws that they're suggesting to expand the authority and the jurisdiction of uh, rabbinic courts, which is only staffed by men. So there's the law uh, that says that, uh, suggesting that rabbinic courts will be allowed to hear civil matters by agreement, of course. Agreement, uh, right. which means I'll only grant you a divorce if you will sit in this rabbinic court and agree upon stuff. Uh, also, right. <laughs> um, but what happens is also, I think it's going to affect that law, which would expand the jurisdiction of uh, rabbinic courts into civil matters by agreement, will not only affect women getting divorced, who will have to you know, who might feel pressured, very readily pressured into agreeing that the rabbinic courts hear all sorts of matters that they, they may have uh, not had to hear or were being heard in the family court. But I think will also affect anybody who, including women, who ha want to sign contracts with uh, um, companies that are maybe run by religious people and will be 
not forced necessarily, but will be um, recommended that, you know, they agree that any matter be adjudicated in front of the rabbi, you know, whether it labor matters or other type of matters, or maybe someone will sign a rental contract and, you know, with a, with a landlord will say, well, if we have any disputes, you have to go to the rabbinic court. So not only, again, are we giving taxpayer money to an institution that is inherently discriminatory, right, because women can cannot sit as uh, adjudicators in that court, which I think in, in a, alone is reason to close the rabbinic courts now as they stand, as state institutions. And just think, how can you have a state institution that uh, only allows men to be judges, only allows black people to be judges, only allow or white people to be judges, or not choose to be judges. I mean, we can't have a, we shouldn't be supporting such an institution that should be privatized. And similarly, we certainly shouldn't be expanding that, the the authority of that court at the taxpayer's expense. Everyone talks about, of course, the burden on the court. And I imagine that's one of the reasons behind this expansion. The burden on the rabbinic courts? No, on the courts in general. And so by transferring some of the, shall we say, petty cases over to the rabbinical courts that now have a lot more manpower, all of a sudden, maybe that takes the burden off the court. If we, if you want us to go into my critique of the rabbinic court, I would love to do that. But the rabbinic court is certainly not an efficient institution, and uh, its rules are very unclear. We don't know. We can, and when you go into the rabbinic courts, you never know how you're going to get out of it. And one of the reasons I opened up the Center for Women's Justice and the, my previous NGO, which was uh, Yad Lishah, was because as an attorney, and I was representing women in the rabbinic courts, I felt that... I, you know, it was very hard. I had to, I had to charge them, right? And I couldn't tell them how long it would take. I couldn't tell them whether it would take five years, you know, a hundred hours, a thousand hours, or two hours to do their case. So, and, and that, that's just the reality in the rabbinic courts, because the rules are unclear. There's no, there's no ending. It's, there's no Sophie Dion. That's what it's called. So I would hardly think that transferring cases to the rabbinic court will uh, will promote efficiency in any way. You've been in the trenches for a long time. Oh and my so gosh! Yes. How many years? I don't want to say. <laughs> several <laughs> decades. Shall several we say. decades. Shall we say? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's quite a bit. And so. I can sense, obviously, some bitterness, and I'm sure. Oh, no. (laughs) But I think part of it is because you've seen so many cases of humans, and specifically women, just getting their rights trampled on throughout your decades of service, wouldn't you say? Well, the way I like to put it now is actually it's it's not just about women's rights, okay? The real problem is the structure of the state, and that's really what is making me so, I I don't say bitter, but concerned really about what's happening today because I see all the work that I've done in the many decades that have passed as part of this whole um, threat to the democracy of the country. And so perhaps I I thought I could contain the problem where the problem was containable to the rabbinic courts. But actually, if you look at it, you know, in a broad scope of what's happening here, there's no constitution. Whatever basic rights we have, I have all sorts of holes in it. There's no clause that protects the equality of women or the equality of all the citizens of the state. And I am very concerned about how the state is going to look for our children and our grandchildren, because I I deeply want the state to continue. I just want to understand what you mean by the sexualization of women. How do you see this playing out? What that means is women's bodies have to be covered up. Women's voices are erva. It's nakedness. They're there to serve as men, you know, uh, know, to be the wombs of men, to be the, you know, to carry their children. And men are the ones that decide if they are divorced or not divorced. That's all part of the, the, the underlying concept that's going on here. 
which is that men are, uh, that women are not agents, that they can't make decisions, that they're not in control, that they're not <laughs> they're not on the courts. Okay, this is all part of that the religious picture. Courts. The relig- well, You're right. Talking, yeah. I'm talking about the, the the theocracy that's that's governing us now, and how the theocracy bleeds into our democracy so far, at least. Is I've I've noted at uh, state functions, state ceremonies that in the past women would sing the national anthem, for instance, on uh, Mem- Remembrance Day, and we're not seeing that anymore. No, women's faces are being obliterated. What's that about? Or girls aren't in books for children. I mean, what, what, you know, it's, that's, it's all part of that picture that people will say, no, 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 of course not. That's not true. Women aren't only sexual objects. Look, women are also on the Supreme Court. And we do have this dichotomy in this country. We have this, this situation where women can be fighter pilots, but they can't get divorced. So there's this sexual, the theocracy, in my opinion, is sexualizing women and their bodies. And the the democratic arm of the state is objecting to it. Of course, you can't obliterate the faces of women. Okay, of course, women have to be judges. Of course, women have to have the right to dis- for freedom and to decide when they 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 want a divorce from their husband. Of course, they should sit on the on the bench. I mean, all of these things, of course, are objecting to what I'm calling the sexualization of women and the infantilization of women and the 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 view of women not as equal to men. I think the word sexualization um, brings it to a, a different headspace for a lot of people. When you say infantilization, I, I understand that a little bit more because it's the where the men were going to protect you. But what you're talking about in terms of the sexualization, where singing the national anthem is would be considered a sexual uh, tantalizing song. It's erva. It's it's nakedness. Right. And now we're in a situation in which the coalition is made up of a lot more religious factions than ever before, meaning the percentage is a lot larger. And so do you see anything so far that is worrying you in terms of more legislation rolling out other than what we've discussed already? Well, I, I, I see empowerment, actually. That's what I see, empower an empowerment of the theocracy. And I can give you an example from a case that we have in, in the Center for Women's Justice. But a simple case is one where a 14-and-a-half-year-old girl was thrown off a bus recently, okay, because the driver thought she wasn't being properly dressed, sexualized again, right? So if she wasn't properly dressed, they threw her off. And I think that that sense of empowerment is is just is not only in the top level but it's in the in the buses in the in the bus drivers it's 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 just i see it all over that uh, the government is feeling empowered to do whatever they want and if what they think is right is to enforce allah that's what they're going to do as they see it and um i'll give you an example of empowerment So we have a case of a woman who wanted to get divorced by agreement with her husband, and she went to the rabbinic courts, and she had been she had gotten married in the rabbinic courts. She had been deemed Jewish enough to get married, and when she came to divorce, they wanted her to go through a Jewish roots investigation again, and she said no for all sorts of reasons. She didn't want to do it, and she just wanted them to do the get by agreement, which is what they would certainly do. And they refused. And we went to the Bagats and we went to the High Court of Justice and we asked them to order the rabbinic court to do the get. And as in most of these cases, and one of the arguments that we had is they can't keep changing the rules all the time. If she was Jewish enough to get married, she should be Jewish enough to get divorced. And um, all the parties involved agreed that they would just do the get in this particular case. And in all of our other cases that we brought in front of the Supreme Court, they usually resolve the issues, the individual issues. And everyone agreed that they would do the get for a client, and they closed the case. They machaku atira. And then the rabbinic courts has still refused to do the get. And she's been waiting two years since she got to the rabbinic courts, 
by agreement with her husband to get to get. It's been since February, since the they the rabbinic court at least ostensibly agreed to do the get. But uh, the rabbinic courts are now refusing to do because they want a declaration of the Supreme Court in this particular case, which would effectively expand their jurisdiction over cases that they would deem that the Jewishness is in question for some reason. So they're insisting on a principled decision, whereas they usually will, in these type of cases, they'll just, you know, be happy and quiet and they will, they will, they will resolve the individual case. But they're emboldened. And basically, they're telling the Supreme Court, we're the ones in control. We're going to tell you what to do. And and this is at the expense of the citizen and, and our client. agreed with her husband to get divorced? The husband, the husband is husband not, trainer. she's not an aguna in the classic sense in which the husband doesn't offer the get, the writ of divorce, right. but... The She's rib- an aguna of the state. Of the rabbinical of, court. Of the state. Of the state. The rabbinical court. That's what everyone forgets. The rabbinic court is an arm of the state. Okay. So she is being held in marital captivity by the state. But this empowerment, and it can and arise no matter what. You know, you're sitting in your office and you're just doing what you always do. And all of a sudden, some religious state actor will decide that they can do whatever they want. That That's really the fear that I'm feeling right now. If before I had this impending dread, now I have this sense of fear and helplessness and uh, disconcertion. In other words, I feel like I'm in this dystopia where, where you know, words don't mean what they are. Like democ- Both sides are using the term democracy to advance their causes, and they're not really articulating what is democracy. And I'm feeling helpless. I think that that I feel that the government is doing everything to take off take off the checks and balances on on them. Okay, and that that's taking various different types of forms. And then they can do whatever they want. And if this government is a theocratic religious government that decides that a client can't get divorced, even though she's agreeing with the husband to get divorced. Or if, you know, you want to just throw someone off the bus because they're not wearing the right clothes or, you know, you, 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 you can't allow a, a, a lecturer to, to, you know, to, to teach men because, she's, because the lecturer happens to be a woman. All these things are happening and there's nothing to stop it. All of these human rights are being violated. All of this, these acts are being justified and violated with that any gatekeeper to protect us. Because the gatekeeper until now has been the court of justice, the high court? Um, There are different types of gatekeepers and all of their powers are, they're attempting to curtail all their powers. It's certainly the Supreme Court and the high court of justice. And so they're trying to curtail the their power. They're trying to curtail, change the laws, even those laws that are have all the holes in them, they're trying to change them. They, all the laws that they now, that, that they're the reasonableness, they can do unreasonable things, okay? Um, they can't, it, if, our, if our prime minister made an agreement, right, to, that he could run, right, only because he, you know, he, he would agree not to be involved in the judicial <laughs> overhaul issues and then he passes a law that allows him to do that the incapacitation law in other words they're they're just everything everything can be analyzed by the fact that they're taking away the brakes on the government the government can do whatever it wants and i don't know where that's going to stop or end so let's talk about the barbie film <laughs> <laughs> okay well i actually went to see but well, i was going to see the barbie film but i actually went to see it because you encouraged me to do so and the thing that kind of is in the back of my mind is Kate McKinnon, okay? And she has this line there that was echoed with me all the time. So Kate McKinnon says, till now, I think she said, you can either be weird, right? Like Kate McKinnon and me, right? Weird. Uh, me too. I'll tell you, okay, right. weird. Or brainwashed, okay? Like brainwashed into thinking that you can only be Stepford wife, a Stepford wife, Barbie, or you know, and then at the end, the women, the Barbies have agency, right? They have agency, and they go and they 
uh, sit on the court and they decide whether they want to be mothers or whether they want to be astronauts, you know. So I think if you look at the feminist movement also, right, it was uh, Catherine McKinnon, ironically the same name, right, Kate McKinnon and Catherine McKinnon. So she, she, the one of the most important things was consciousness raising. And I think that what you see now, and that's an optimistic note, right, is the consciousness raising of much of the Israeli population. Okay, you don't get them out there. They're not out there protesting by the hundreds of thousands for weeks on end because they're not conscious of what's happening here. They're not conscious of a lot of things that I'm trying, I hope, and you know, I managed to explain to you, which is that you know, women are not handmaids. They're not, you know, they they are agents. They can decide. They can understand. They can, they can critique. They can uh, use their wiles in, in a sophisticated and, uh, way. And they're, they're not, not just props for Ken, although in the movie it seems that Ken may have been a prop for Barbie, but okay, we won't go into that. Actually, yeah, let's do talk about that. And I thought that was kind of the more uh, interesting narrative in the film that Ken had to find his own power. And right. when he, spoiler, uh, experiences the patriarchy that is reality, uh, he all of a sudden thrives and finds himself. Just having that as a narrative thread through in the Barbie movie, I thought was very interesting. Well, I think it was powerful. I think it was... I think it was also part of the consciousness raising, don't you think? That it was telling you, it was saying, you know, this isn't just normal that only men are in the boardroom and are, and, and, and even though a woman thought about, the, you know, was the creator of Barbie, right? A she, Jewish woman. A Jewish woman was the creator of Barbie. A not Barbie-ish Jewish woman and not, you know, Definitely. was the creator of Barbie. It was all these men in the boardroom that were in control. And I can like that, right? Ken liked being in control. And our Ken's like being in control of the rabbinic courts. <laughs> 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 and in control of the government. And And we're not weird because we say that. We're not just these weird, oddball feminists who talk about sexualization and the patriarchy, okay? Because the patriarchy is real, okay? And the sexualization is real. And the more we can confront that and see that, I think, the more we will perhaps advance. And I think we see half the population seeing that. So I can, I'm no longer weird. I am just part of the hundreds of thousands that are looking at things differently now and saying that the normal is is not acceptable. Susan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. My colleague, Carrie keller Lynn recently wrote an analysis of how the status of women has or may be changed by the current government. She writes, by the times of Israel's count, there are about 20 proposed policy changes that would adversely affect women's standing. Among the most prominent in public conversation are a pullback on signing the Istanbul Convention, an international accord to combat violence against women. There's also a coalition promise to enable gender-based discrimination in public spaces and in publicly funded events, and another coalition promise to exempt religiously motivated discrimination from the current anti-discrimination law. And that's just the tip of this iceberg. Special thanks to Charlie Summers, who helps me with the What Matters Now transcripts. This episode was recorded by Jamal Rishek at the Nomi Studios in Jerusalem. What Matters Now is produced and edited by The Pod Waves. Have a comment about this or other episodes of What Matters Now? Email us at podcast at timesofisrael.com. Look for more What Matters Now episodes and subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. Until next week, Shalom. Shalom.